are the first person to see a bit of Sue's blood vessels. Yes. That's and rad. you're gonna be the second. <laughs> it's this hollow branching yes, yeah. shape. That Sue in question is Sue the T-Rex. And we are about to see proof that she was warm blooded. We went to the Field Museum to see how they work their magic. Our first stop was. So here is our dinosaur and oversized collections. That's Jingmei O'Connor. And she, you know what, I'll let her tell you. Yeah, I would uh, say I'm one of the world's experts on Mesozoic birds. Not to brag or anything, no, I'm just kidding. And one of the key questions she asks with her research is why birds were the only dinosaurs to survive the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. We need to look at birds and we then we need to like back up from birds and look at the dinosaurs closely related. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny, but we have a drawer full of bits of soup. When you have the edge of the puzzle, that's the easiest part to do, right? The inside of the puzzle is harder to put together. So these are like the inside puzzle bits. You can't figure out where they go, but this is to our advantage because these are the type of fragments that it's okay for us to do destructive analyses yeah. on. The destruction of these rare and one-of-a-kind fossils can involve slicing or dissolving in acid. Slicing allows the scientists to study specimens histologically. You have to cut a piece of the bone, remove it, grind it down so it's really thin so that light can pass through it so you can study it under a microscope. It's a cost-benefit analysis essentially, right? What are the questions you're trying to answer? Is it worth it to damage this extremely rare important fossil? To show me how it's done, they demonstrated with a prehistoric bird bone. You're going to bring it to, in our case, Akiko Shinya. She's our chief fossil preparator. She's amazing. Akiko starts by taking a small slice of the specimen. You then take your little chunk of bone that you removed and you drop it into resin. Mm -hmm. And then this needs to cure for several days. <laughs> uh, I mean, can you imagine playing like Dungeons and Dragons with like dinosaur dice? Dinosaurs. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> exactly. Then you glue your D6 to a microscope slide and slice it down even more. I did a terrible job with the saw. I, I, I almost destroyed everything with the saw, actually. I feel like I'm pushing too hard. Okay. okay. <laughs> I did it. Still have quite a bit of ways to go, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would take a while. At this point, it's too small to slice, so Akiko will grind away extra layers. Then here is mm -hmm. the diamond dust, so that's where the, uh, the grinding surface is. If you grind it a tiny bit, a little by little, and then you will eventually start hearing the noise. Um, We're listening for that shug shug sound. The slide ultimately needs to be between 30 and 80 microns thick, thinner than a sheet of paper. Akiko basically uses finer and finer grinders, like varying grades of sandpaper, to slowly shave off extra layers. Straight down, that's the key. I'll, I'll, I will try my best. Yeah, you, sure you, now, you scared me now, though. There's a polishing stage to smooth out any major imperfections that might obstruct the sample. Oh, oh. You're not getting away from me and a second polish for fine tuning. This one feels like someone is like pulling carpet out from underneath the block. Even with your naked eye, you can learn about a specimen. Here's a piece of Sue's rib, and you can see how Sue grew, almost like rings on a tree. You see these faint lines? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be it much looks like agate. Yeah, it'll be much clearer once we get it under a microscope, but those are the lines of arrested growth. Do you want to look in? Yeah, okay. And here we're looking into the rib of Sue the T-Rex. You notice that the space between these lines of growth is becoming smaller and smaller. So when it was younger and really having to bulk up, right? It was growing very quickly, and as it reaches adult size, sl uh, growth slows down. The thinness of these sections was surprising because it shows a fast growth rate. A key indicator that Sue had a high metabolic rate, meaning she was probably not as cold-blooded as scientists previously thought. 
scientists also looked at another indicator of high metabolism, which is actually color. More diverse colors in a species tends to mean a higher metabolism. Here we are looking at an SEM image of a sample from a feather of a 130 million year old bird called Aeo confuciusornis. So Pre-extinction. So the only fossil bird older than this fossil bird is Archaeopteryx. A scanning electron microscope relies on electrons instead of light to magnify even more detail. And so if you look closely, you'll see these this is literally what we call them, sausage-looking structures. <laughs> they are aeomelanosomes. So aeomelanosomes are responsible for the color black. Melanosomes are organelles found in animal cells that are associated with different colors. When they fossilize, they leave behind distinct shapes. If they're very nicely um, aligned with each other, we can tell it's iridescent black. If they're kind of a more oval-shaped aeomelanosomes, that's gray. And then if it's a phaeomelanosome, we call these ones meatballs. Literally, this is like Such in papers, science. they're like the meatball-shaped ones. <laughs> like, mm, I'm hungry. The meatball-shaped phaeomelanosomes are responsible for a rusty red color. Many of the genes responsible for melanosomes are also linked to things that affect metabolism. So evolving one most likely evolves the other. And with both meatballs and sausages, Aeoconfucius ornus shows way more melanosome size diversity than modern day cold-blooded lizards. So we can say that the dinosaurs that are becoming smaller, that are getting these, these large extravagant ornamental structures that are then able to evolve flight are also becoming more colorful. But these melanosomes can only tell us so much. They're an indicator of warm-bloodedness, but not definitive proof. This is where Yasmina comes in. Everything that Yasmina is doing five years ago, that didn't exist. I'm a molecular paleobiologist. My passion lies uh, uh, within the, the clade of dinosaurs, including modern birds. People tend to think of bones and shells and these kind of like heart tissues that preserve much more readily. But if we want to get a complete picture about the diversity of life on our planet, we really depend on soft tissue preservation. Soft tissue is the squishy stuff like skin, blood vessels, and other non-bony materials that scientists didn't even think could preserve until recently. So about 30 years ago, paleontologists, vertebrate paleontologists, tried for the first time to extract soft tissues from dinosaur heart tissues. Her name is Mary Schweitzer, and people did not believe her findings. It was very critically perceived. And people thought for a long time that while these soft tissue structures very much look like the original biological structures, they could not possibly be related. But soft tissues do preserve. Why do they preserve? This is absolutely paradoxical mm -hmm. based on what was known scientifically at that point in time. You can actually see traces of it under a UV light. What we're gonna do is just shine the light and look for things. It looks like some of these may be scales that are preserving soft tissue, not all of them. Once soft tissues are suspected, demineralization will isolate them if they're present so you can see the structures. This is where I got to try something with Sue's bones that has never been done before. So you mentioned that you would like to dissolve a Sue fragment and help us look for organics because every bone is going to have the tissues that we're looking for if they are in fact preserved. But Sue has exceptional preservation, so we are quite hopeful. We're taking this bit of Sue and dissolving it in hydrochloric acid. The acid will dissolve any inorganic rock, but leave behind the organic soft tissues. It's starting to look like a hazy IPA. Have you seen anything? It's all still in suspension. No, we'll have to. Me too. Give it a little bit of time. After about 15 minutes, the precipitate settles and Yasmina pipettes it onto a slide. From here we go to the microscope. Let's go. Ooh, and this is looking good. What are you seeing? We have a couple of extracellular matrix pieces, blood vessels, large <gasps> blood vessel fragments. Are you are the first person to see a bit of Sue's blood vessels? Yes. I was the second person to see Sue the T-Rex's veins. Right now, take a look. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
You see the blood vessel structure? It's right in the focus center. It's this hollow branching yes, yeah. shape. That is definitely one of like the bone vascular canals. <gasps> oh, I see it real good now. Hold on. They've just been in there the whole time. They've been just sitting there for 65 million years. <laughs> that was rad. Because we can look at this, are of course fascinated by the fact that you know, soft tissues preserve in deep time. But there's actually a lot of information in the molecular composition yeah, of these materials. Demineralization shows us that there are soft tissues present in a specimen, including the proteins, lipids, and sugars that indicate a high metabolism. But to concretely say what soft tissues are present and prove that this vein is really a vein and that these metabolic stress markers are actually here, we need to study the chemicals found in the tissues. This requires a brand new method, an application of Raman spectroscopy developed by Yasmina and her team. It's the brightest, purest green that you will ever see. Yeah, why the green light? We're using a green light that is exactly 532 nanometers that um, is particularly good for characterizing organics with many unsaturated carbon bonds. It's a non-destructive technique, so you can stick entire specimens under the laser without having to prepare them at all. We popped in a piece of suit taken from her femur core. Um, we want to make sure that we're looking at a spot where we don't have too much surface texture, where we have a lot of carbonaceous material preserved. The laser excites the different materials in the sample. And so these chemical bonds, they start to vibrate in direct response to their chemical environment. And these like very specific little wiggles um, are then detected in form of a spectrum. Now, if we want to, for example, learn something about the metabolic rate mm -hmm. of SU, we collect you know, the spectrum for SU and for all other kinds of dinosaurs that have this mode of preservation. I can show you like basically like what it looks like when you compare these different spectra. This is Sue's Raman data compared to data Yasmina got from other dinos. So every individual line basically represents evidence of the total composition of one of the fossils we've looked at. So these numbers are sort of different wiggles? Yes. <laughs> so you get a different wiggle at um, each of these different wave numbers and that then evidences a different kind of molecular bond vibration, so different kind of chemical compound present in the sample. Different compounds tell us different things about the dinosaur we're looking at. For example, pheoethers, sulfur heterocycles, and nitrogen heterocycles in the soft tissues signal high metabolic stress. We have very high amounts of these metabolic stress markers in warm-blooded animals, and we have very low amounts of these metabolic stress markers in cold-blooded animals. This peak uh, here, in combination with um, this peak here and this one here, tells us um, if we're looking at a warm-blooded or a cold-blooded extinct animal. This wiggle here is proof that Sue the T-Rex was truly warm-blooded. And it once again changes the story of evolution that scientists have been telling and retelling since the early days of paleontology. It has been suggested that the high metabolism of birds eventually like, helped them to better adapt to the changing environments, the changing conditions right after the mass yeah. extinction event. What we basically realize here once we start putting these, um, these new physiological data in a context is that this incredibly high avian metabolism is actually not an avian innovation. It's not just Sue either. Yasmina's work has definitively found that most dinos were warm-blooded practically upending what was once common knowledge. I have been coming to the Field Museum since I was a little kid. Oh, the Tommy Monster! This is my favorite fossil. I won't get this Being able to come to the Field Museum and see how the Field Museum works was like a dream come true for tiny paleontologist Abby. He has the concept. The Abby roll. Got him. Oh, you're right. Uh, 